All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Monta. I'm the Associate Director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at Notre Dame. Uh, and it is a, a great honor and privilege to be able to, to chair a, a panel with the three gentlemen here. Um, the title of the panel, as you know, is Social Responsibility and Luxury Goods. The other day, I was in Chicago sitting at a very posh uh, breakfast table in the Palmer House Hilton. Um, but we were running an event at the Institute there. And my friend Paul Coleman, Father Paul Coleman, who is the director of the Center for Social Concerns, was at a table just uh, next to me. And he had his head in his hands. And as he got up, I, was, I asked him, so Father Paul, how are you doing? I'm, I'm chairing a panel tomorrow. And he said, oh, what? And I said, social responsibility and luxury goods. And I said, how would you approach such a topic? And he looked at me and kind of rubbed his chin. And he said, awkwardly. <laughs> and I think that's kind of. Uh, the spirit in which I'm standing uh, up here before you, uh, a little bit awkward, because if you start to conjure with those terms, social responsibility, luxury goods, luxury, luxuria, rankness, excess, how do these things go together? How are we supposed to think about this? But if you start breaking these terms open a little bit, things become a lot more interesting. So, for example, luxury goods is not really a term from economics. They use the term superior good. Uh, and they talk about goods quite a lot in classical economics. You know, a, a superior good or a luxury good is simply a good that you purchase that will take a bigger percentage of your income, right? So as your income increases, you might say, well, uh, I'll just purchase more things, and that's a normal good. A superior good or a luxury good would, be, would take a bigger, a bigger percentage of that rising income. So you could be buying a toothbrush, say, for 99 cents, and then if you're only making $10,000 a year, you might say, well, I want a battery toothbrush. It might be $2. But that's actually a luxury good. There are also inferior goods where, as people's income rise, you know, they buy less of a certain thing, or even Veblen goods. You know, Theodore Veblen, the theorist who says that if he was the first theorist of conspicuous consumption, and he says if people buy things because they're expensive, some people do that. So if the price actually drops on something, they'll stop buying it, which is bizarre. To, so um, there's also the sense that luxury goods are wasteful or extravagant. There's the sense that um, they're high quality, right? A luxury good is something that's very plush, very elegant, um, artisanal maybe. So, but at the same time, things that are artisanal are also handmade by small producers, kind of democratic. The craft beer movement is small producer guys. These are not huge firms that are involved in this. So how, how do we think about luxury goods and the social together? It's a lot more complicated than I think that we can initially feel. So to shed light on all of this today, we have three terrific panelists. Uh, Abe Scherner, who is here to my left, is a doctorate from the University of Toronto. He was a tutor in classics and ancient philosophy at St. John's College in Annapolis. He's now the founder and winemaker of the Scolium Project, which experiments and wonders about what grapes could be instead of what consultants say they should be or the market says they should be. He's also got a writing, a very interesting writing project in the works. We have Michele, Sa uh, I'm sorry, Jim Miam, American Bartender of the Year contributing editor at Food & Wine Magazine, co-founder, managing partner of a cocktail lounge in New York City called PDT, which, please don't tell, is that what it is? Which has won numerous accolades, from the, including the James Beard Foundation. He's the author of numerous articles for the New York Times, Bon Appetit, GQ.com, among others, and is the author most recently of the PDT cocktail book. And last, we have Michele Sata, one of the great winemakers in Italy from the Bulgari region in southern Tuscany. Michele Sata is the father of six. He calls himself, this is how he described himself, uh, a father of six, a farmer, and a winemaker. Founded my winery in the, in the 80s in the Bulgari region of Tuscany after become fascinating with the technical and cultural aspects of winemaking in his previous occupation of farm management. That's entirely too modest. Mr. Sata is one of the most interesting winemakers in Italy, as Abe is one of the most interesting winemakers in Napa. And uh, they are all both, along with Jim, extremely reflective about what they do. So we're very happy to have them here. The, I think they'll each speak for about seven minutes, seven to ten minutes. Uh, Jim will go first, and then we'll have time 
at first for them to respond to each other a little bit, and then to take questions from you all. So thanks for coming. Good afternoon. Apologize, I'm a little bit sick, so I sound a little stuffy. Um, I'm super honored to be here. I grew up in Oak Park and River Forest, where there are more Notre Dame flags flying than city of Chicago, state of Illinois, or country of United States. So it's great to be back. Um, fortunately, not as a student or a football player. Um, I'm here today because of uh, this gentleman over here, Father Bill Daly. Uh, I met him a number of years ago. He was the chaplain of a cocktail competition that I was a judge for in DC. And Father Bill ended up doing some postgraduate work in New York, which uh, brought him closer to me and to uh, my little um, community of uh, worshipers at PDT. A little bar called Please Don't Tell in New York. If you tell someone not to do something, that's exactly what they're going to do. So uh, that's been a huge part of our success. So why, you might ask, uh, would a bartender be speaking to you uh, at a conference about poverty? This is a question that I asked myself, uh, terrifying in the beginning. Uh, and I find that nowadays, the more terrifying the, the uh, ask, the more excited I am to present. So I, I did some reflecting, as Anthony said. Um, and I think it comes down to, you know, I'll, I'll tackle this social responsibility thing. A mentor of mine named Steve Olson, who's done a lot of education all over the United States, once described bartenders and servers uh, as having this unique and indelible characteristic. And here I'm talking about the good ones, not the ones who are slacking. Uh, he said that each and every one of us share a unique need to make other people happy. He called it a sick need to make other people happy. And it's this, I guess it's a bit of a, you could call it a voyeurism of sorts, but it, what distinguishes my colleagues who really are great at serving in bars and restaurants is how much joy they get by serving people. These aren't the people that go out and have a better time at you on the fun side of the bar. These are the people that stand on the other side of the bar and watch, enjoy watching other people have a great time. And I think this started to make me think about you know, the characteristics of what a great server is. And in, in many ways, server, I mean service. I feel like for me, you know, 20 years ago when I decided to stay in the bar and restaurant business for the rest of my life, I felt a calling to serve. And I will not, I will not parallel this calling to serve to Father Bill's calling to serve, uh, or the collars we wear or don't wear behind the bar. But I think that, you know, I thought about, you know, what, um, what James Heckman said about skills. He talked about skills in his opening, uh, you know, speech to us. And, you know, what what sort of skills you need to develop and what sort of skills our workforce needs to develop. And what I find great servers share is humility. You have to be humble to be a great server in a bar or restaurant. Sacrifice, you have to put your needs aside. No matter how you're feeling or what you'd rather be doing when you're attending bar, you need to go get that beer or you need to go get that side of ketchup or whatever, whatever it is, as small as it seems to be. You have to have faith. And when I say faith, you have to have faith in the humanity of others. This means that when someone does something in a bar or restaurant that is totally seems selfish or unsensible or rude or whatever it is, you have to have faith that that person is not doing that because they're a bad person. And you have to believe every day that these people you're serving are great. And last, and probably most importantly, you have to have character. Um, I would describe, and it's not for this seven minute talk, which won't be seven minutes. Um, that what I've done for 20 years is I've mastered the gray area. Uh, the bar and restaurant business is not a black and white business. And interestingly, if we step back, life isn't black and white either. And my ability to make moral and ethical decisions inside the black and white is what has distinguished my career. In many ways, I find that I'm, I am where I am today more because of what I haven't done than what I have done. And especially considering the group of pirates that I work with, I think that doesn't say much about me at all. Um, let's take a look, I think, importantly about the predicament of a server. And I think this is where we look at how bartenders and servers or just people in the service industry maybe could be used as an example for what to do about poverty. In the beginning, if you think about it, most people who work in the service industry they're, they're taking a job at minimum wage or even less with the idea that their tips will supplement their income. I wouldn't call it the vow of poverty that 
certain priests or um, ecclesiastical people take, but there is a bit of an understanding that you are not going to get paid a lot um, with the hope that you'll make money and tips. And in order to get promoted throughout the course of your career as a server, you have to engage in what I'm going to call a virtuous cycle of hospitality. It's this notion of you doing well, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. And those who do this end up moving from waiter maybe to bartender and bartender to manager and manager to general manager. And you move from a position where you make very little money to not necessarily a lot of money, but maybe you have benefits. Uh, maybe you don't have to worry from day to day whether someone is going to leave you a, a large tip or not. And as we talk about tips, I'll be really quick in the sense that I remember back in my college days when a lot of my bartender buddies would come in and they'd leave me a $20 bill no matter whether they had one beer or two beers or three beers. And sometimes four or five or six of them come in and I'd have $120 in my pocket for doing very little. Uh, the $20 bill is sort of the, the tip of choice among the service industry. And I think for me, that $20 bill was never mine. It was something that I ended up coming back to their bar either a few nights later or a week later or a month later and giving back. So I think that in some ways working for tips or working the, the money that I received in the industry has never been something that I've seen as my right, but it's something that I had and maybe used for a little while and passed on. Um, I'd like to move forward, you know, in talking about this mobility throughout the service industry and rehashing, you know, faith, discipline, and responsibility had moved me up in the career. And, and getting to sort of what, how we address poverty, charity events themselves. Uh, the first charity events that I worked in in New York City, um, Share Our Strength uh, events that New York Magazine promoted, uh, events that like the, the City Meals on Wheels at Rock Center, I could go through five or ten events, but I mean, what, it, what I've found in my career in New York City is that a number of very high profile charity events have been the way that a lot of chefs have been introduced to the New York City sort of food and wine scene, a lot of bartenders have been introduced to the scene, and I kind of wanted to sort of put it out there because I, I was saying to Carter yesterday that many may not realize, but that chefs and, and winemakers, spirits producers, bartenders, restaurateurs are at the center of, of fundraising. I mean, and it's, they may not be the, the first person you think of when you think of charity events, but I mean, think of the last time you went to a black tie event and you didn't have a glass of champagne or you didn't have a whiskey or a martini or that the you weren't served meat or given it as an option for your second course. Um, chefs and sommeliers, bartenders, winemakers, we all sort of serve that part. And I think one of the things that excites me as I've gone from making a name for myself uh, in, the, in the early days at these events because the media was covering them was being now at the center of organizing these events. And I'd just like to sort of lay it out for you. You know, there's a bit of a formula or what my one of my mentors called a, a bit of a mousetrap for charity events. And the idea is you kind of take, you take famous chefs, you take TV personalities or entertainers, people that are gonna bring a lot of buzz to an event, you find a great venue, um, you serve people, ideally the food and wine of those sort of better known people in that venue. Um, you create a great stage for them. Uh, you invite a lot of media to make sure that the media is document what is being served, who's there and what's going on. And you invite a lot of people who have a lot of resources. And essentially, you make a very public stage um, where there's peer pressure for them to give. Uh, and that peer pressure to give, documented by the media, is the perfect formula for what I've found through the years for raising money. I've found that when one of those elements isn't there, when the media isn't there to make sure that the gifts are documented or the, or the personalities are documented, or where there's no pressure to give, that money isn't given. Um, I think that for me, what I have begun to realize over the years is that there's a cycle for everything. There's only so much people can give and a lot of it has to do with their, their money that they can give away for tax purposes for charity and that there's a lot of work that bartenders, winemakers, like these two gentlemen here, um, can add to that equation. So next year I will make sure that all the wine and spirits that Carter is serving at his house are donated. Um, I'd like to end, for my seven minutes, on uh, luxury goods, the most terrifying aspect of our speech today. And I started thinking about it in a bar while I was drinking. And actually, I was in a distillery while I was drinking. And as I was at Buffalo Trace a couple weeks ago in Kentucky, where they actually make Pappy Van Winkle, the bourbon that we're all 
looking for right now that none of us will find in our liquor store. Um, I was in their, their barrel house and they showed me the Pappy Van Winkle barrels. And it's interesting, the Pappy Van Winkle barrels are filled, the barrel was initially filled so, uh, between 15, 20, 23 years ago. And what's left in the barrel now is around five to seven gallons of, of spirit. There's almost nothing left. And the story you'll hear if you ever go to a distillery is that every year 10% of the spirit evaporates in what is the distillers call the angel share. And I started thinking to myself, I'm going to Notre Dame next week and I should start thinking about this angel share. I'm sure there will be lots of angels at Notre Dame. Uh, and it, it kind of caught me there. They have to pay taxes for the spirit when it comes off the still. So something fermented like wine or something brewed like beer comes off the still, Buffalo Trace pays taxes on it, it goes into a barrel and over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years it evaporates. And what's left after the angels take it is a spirit that at that point is, is a very premium product. And in many ways, I thought about how that, that spirit, that, that embodiment of what is luxurious, what is excellent, what is great, has been impoverished over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and that in the impoverishment it goes through has created value in it. And in some sort of strange allegorical or metaphorical way, I'd like to present fine spirits themselves as a sort of metaphor for redistribution. You know, we're looking for a product that someone has to pay for, invest in up front, uh, like our government or like our communities, uh, like ourselves. And those who want to enjoy that product, if they can find it in the case of Pappy Van Winkle, have to pay uh, a serious premium. Uh, so I guess that's an idea. I'm no economist that I'd like to leave with you guys uh, before I bring these other gentlemen on stage. Thank you very much. Ciao. Um, sorry, but uh, <clears throat> I read because I wrote with Italian words and uh, my English is not enough to, to speak directly and probably your Italian also is not enough <laughs> for my language. Poverty and caring for the poor. The introduction to my speech is in gratitude to you who are here to listen to the result of my experience and in gratitude to the University of Notre Dame. In particular, I extend my thanks to Professor Sneed, who invited me to share my experience in making quality wine within the context of your conference. I would like to preface my speech by expressing my great gratitude for what I encountered in my work. The experience of cultivating the soil and the wonder of making wine. I am humbly thankful for having found teachers who have illuminated my path, in particular Don Giussani, founder of Communion and Liberation, who has involved me in discovering that Christianity realizes all works of humanity. I asked myself the following, the following questions. What does it mean to make quality wine? or rather, to focus on the question posed by the conference, how is making quality wine different from producing food? <coughs> Second, what relation is there with the experience of poverty? What aspects of this experience can be utilized to outline a proposal that we can relaunch after this meeting? Quality wine. I am using the expression quality wine to indicate a wine that costs even more than 10 times or even 100 times the average market price of a normal bottle. And this prompts us to question whether it is moral to make it and even drink it. In my story, the discovery of what quality wine is coincided with the discovery of the taste of my life, of my work as a winemaker. <coughs> This is not coming from a commercial thought, rather from my personal experience. In 74, I arrived in Bulgaria, now 
It's one of the four places made famous in Italy for the production of expensive and celebrated wines, the legendary Sassicaia, for example, a county village on the Tuscan coast coming from Varese, a northern industrial city. I was 19 years old, and at the beginning of my university studies, I joined a farm as an apprentice, working part-time while attending the University of Pisa in agriculture. In October, I immediately took part in the harvest at the farm. It was the first time I harvested, prepared warts, vats, cleaned everything in the cellar, encountered every step of the work process. In short, a true agricultural badness. It almost makes me laugh to see that I'm talking about myself, my life, and yet I'm talking about a different era. At the time, in fact, there were still farms and the harvest was the last gathering of the agricultural year and it was necessary to obtain sufficient food and wine for sustaining the life of the farmers for the following year. The entire community of the farm, a group of about 20 people, attended the event and there was a joyous atmosphere similar to the last day of school. We brought home the fruit of the labor of the year. Thank God. Even for the farmers fiercely hostile toward any religious conception, exclaimed, thank God. A sense of unity between hands and bodies, the earth and the sun, the rain and the wind dominated. In each one, there was a clear perception of entirety, an entirety that allowed life and the harvest and their own existence, an entirety that could not be manipulated by one's will, in brief, an ancient dimension of existence. Wine in itself was a special celebration, a greater portion of what happiness so real yet so rare to find in a day. A celebration of a simple life connected with the heart, the sun, and the strenuous daily work of cultivation. The wine was a unique product. It was still a fruit of the heart and needed to live, to receive strength and energy to work. The more there was, the better. Across our Italian lands, it was normal to work for this. There was a vineyard for each family and for each farm. And in the centuries, we did not even need to trade much and enhance the production areas. Everyone drank his wine. From the Alps to Sicily, every home had wine on the table every day. This is the wine as I knew in 74. I discovered this when, after a few years as director of the company where I took my first steps as a farmer, I decided to start my own business and I began leasing vineyards and a winery in order to be a winemaker. I cannot explain all the details of the experiences that guided me. It would take too long, but it was there that I have discovered something new. That wine has in itself a surprising nature. It can reveal a character and more. The vineyard, almost like a person, responds to the particular soil in which it is planted to the way it is prepared and cultivated. It expresses itself in very different ways depending on the variety that composes it and essentially corresponds to an infinite, infinite number of choices that every producer, every single man makes. It's not like a growing wheat. Not only that, the wine carries a characteristic different from all other agricultural products. Rather than deteriorate over time, it can improve. And this character of long life depends on its nature interwined with the quality of the man's work. Wine impacts the man who tastes it in a fascinating way, depending on where it comes from, the variety of the grape, the vintage of the producer is able to give an enormous variety of different sensations. Here is the passage. No more wine food, but wine pleasure, wine history, wine culture, 
Don't drink, don't drink it for thirst, for thirst, but for taste. Here is a summary of the key moments of what I, I do to express what I said. The choice of the land where planting a vineyard and the choice of grapes that I think suitable for the place. When I planted my first vineyard on one lizard parcel, I selected four different varieties of grapes and I planted them at higher density than in the past. When I cooled, I decided to buy some land on the basis of exposure and the nature of the soil, which I considered suitable. The cultivation of plants, the tillage and the growing of the vegetation. Her hectare of vineyard is home to over 5,000 individuals, single plants, and the fruit that I will use to get the wine comes from the work of an entire year of the plant mother. Each plant has its own balance and the man who cultivates the vineyard must prune, clean, remove the leaves, orient branches, choose how to work the land, face the possible disease. Each of these actions will substantially determine the final result and will lead to the last important choice, the time of harvest. Third, the perfect care of ripening of the grapes, the timing of the harvest. Here, it is easy to understand that if I harvest today or in 10 days, they're going to lack the characteristics of the wine we change, and the wine will be affected. If you have a good experience of the character of the soil and the climate evolution and a sense of your own intuition, the best method of choice remains the tasting of the grapes. When we feel they are ready, we harvest. Simple and with no rules. The technical details of winemaking. This phase of the production of wine is the most studied, quoted and exalted because of the wide availability of current technology and the great temptation to manipulate. I work using technique, but I do not need to add or alter the fruit of the wine of the vine until distorting the natural data. At the cellar, I use steel tanks and wooden barrels. I use a refrigerator to control the temperature of musts and wines and limit as much as possible each addition of enological products. Above all, I produce wine only with grapes of my wines, without additions. I shall defer the team technique, yes, but what and how to a future meeting. The union of different kinds of wine to form the single label. The varieties of grapes are harvested and fermented separately, so I get a lot of different wines, wines at the time of assembly, post-harvest. When I decide the wines I will produce in that vintage, I taste and assess up to 60 different wines of the vintage. This is the final act that ends the course of production, the choice that is entrusted to our palate, in fact to our noses, which identifies on and selects the best of each. In my experience, therefore, the initial discovery of the charm of rural life and of wine as a joyful product that rewarded the vital exuberance of the relationship between man and nature, has become the discovery of an intimate and incredible ability of the wine. To be a product that is not only food, the nature of which is to respond to my need of feeding my body, revealing something higher that tells me a story, a relationship. Wine is a place, a fruit, a hair, a person. Wine is the expression of a dimension of existence where the biological need is not everything, but there is a spiritual necessity and joy for pleasure's sake. Wine Poverty Connection Here is what I think on this matter and how I feel poverty touches my life. Poverty is the lack of assets that make life satisfying, not just possible. You cannot live without eating, being homeless or without health. 
You are poor without these conditions or even when these conditions are unsuitable. But you are poor even when there is no self-consciousness or a self-esteem. When we are not respected, loved and understood, we do not have a flourishing from our existence. In any case, poverty affects everyone and this becomes evident when we die. <coughs> Therefore, I think there are two levels in which the issue of poverty raises my conscience as a producer of excellent wines. How I can help poor people to become less poor materially and how I can allow a spiritual growth or an education for all. Now, the fact that the product expresses a beauty, a harmony, a taste that enriches the existence is a gift for everyone. I hope I have delivered to you the message that making quality wines involves a journey that reveals a wealth, reveals a wealth hidden in the fruit, in the soil, in the climate, in all days that made up the vintage, but also reveals the wealth of intelligence, of knowledge, and of human dedication. A wealth that each of us can have hidden, a wealth that is often a mortal gem to be restarted for those who are marginalized. If the poor is by definition the needy, what is beautiful, good, and enjoyable beyond the pure necessity is certainly for the poor. Benedict XVI uh, uh, wrote, The wine expresses the exquisiteness of creation and gives us the feast in which we go beyond the limits of everyday life. Wine gladdens the heart. So the wine and the wines have even become images of the gift of love, in which we can experience some of the flavor of the divine. Job proposal. With regard to the economic issue, as well as the obvious, obvious implication that if I create income and employment, this in itself entails an increase in wealth for others, a difficult consideration arises. We have to undertake the best suitable job model that respects all factors described by my activity and that helps the development of material well-being of men. In my experience, there is an evidence. We get the quality of the goodness with the direct engagement of the person with his activity and a simple way of working by hands, mind and heart. Then, we will have to promote, encourage and defend the small activities embodying family character. The vast network of micro-activities today is attacked and rendered impossible by the demands of finance and politics, dominated by mega murders by the global world, by the accumulation of money, of faceless management, without identity, which have transformed the work in many parts of the world in a new form of slavery. In the little microcops of a wine producer, you can see a different model of development that can build on these skills, person, family, personal identity. It can offer to the single temporary employee, maybe immigrant, a work as a protagonist. Each of us here can make a little contribution in his, in his no, a little contribution, his own self, both in the profession where we are responsible as well as in our, our social board. The tradition of Christianity has been able at various times to reconstruct a form of enterprise that helps people to be more free from insidious dangers of poverty. Thank you, and until our next visit, why not in Tuscany? It's such a pleasure and such an honor to be here, and so great to be part of this panel. Michele and I are coming at, I think, very much the same question 
in somewhat different ways. And we have also, I think, in some sense, our thinking is going to conclude in places very similar. But I want to introduce, in particular, this thought, um, which departs a little bit from where Michele ended, and for me, is a very, very important question to confront. And that is, consider the quotation from um, Benedict that Michele put on uh, the screen only a few moments ago about the excellence of wine. Chastened to some degree by a remark that Professor Wilkin made yesterday distinguishing between apologetics and exegesis, I had, um, in a way, recast my paper this very morning to make sure that it was not an apologetic. And chastened further by Professor Finnis yesterday, who was so severe in the distinction between more and less rational forms of criticism, I decided that it was really important for me not only to make an exegetic as opposed to an apologetic paper, but to confront with absolute, um, to embrace the terror that is involved in confronting the possibility that one's own way of life is not moral and that involves deep problems. And so this is the last thing that I wanted to add to what Michele put on the board, which in some way is a new beginning for my talk, that is this. Given that wine can be such a beautiful and excellent thing, what does it mean that it has also become a luxury product and that I, in particular, am a producer of a product that most of the people in this room could not afford to make part of their daily lives? In a way, that could be the sum of my talk just to oppose this question. Now I'll wipe my brow, having said that, and I'm gonna guide you towards what I hope will be a way of addressing that question. And this is the way. I'm gonna step outside of the world of wine and look at another realm of luxury products, uh, namely fine dining. And in some sense, fine dining and luxury wine are not separable from each other, at least in the United States. And this in itself is a sign of how different it is to talk about wine as a luxury product than it is to talk about wine as the produce of a small farm. There, the wine is tied to home cooking, not to fine dining. So what I want you now is to picture some of the most expensive but also most sought after restaurants in the world, and in particular a restaurant that's very famous in Stockholm named Noma. Uh, this is the most uh, sought after restaurant seat anywhere in the world. And this is what is remarkable and what is relevant to our questioning today. The plates at Noma are not piled high with any form of food at all, nor are expensive delicacies like foie gras dominating the plate. The plate is sparse. It is square or oblong or circular could be white, it could be gray. There'll be no trace of the way that China is decorated. There's no gold on it. There might be no markings at all. And what there will be are a few small pieces of food, many of them not even cooked. In other words, served to you raw, arranged in an architectural fashion that owes something to Japanese aesthetics and owes nothing to European home cooking. This is Noma, and the dominance of Noma throughout the world of fine dining is now complete. Any restaurant that takes itself seriously anywhere in the first world has to make a gesture to Noma and to what I might call the aesthetics of sparseness. So what I'm pointing to now is something that for me is very, very interesting, that at this point in the first world, Luxury is tied to a very artificial, and by artificial I don't mean anything negative in its sense, but I mean something that is deeply imbued with very sophisticated artifice. Luxury is, not, is now tied not to excess, but to a highly articulated, intentionally created form of sparseness, and one might even say monasticism. I would use that word more lightly in another context. I feel like I have to be careful about it here, but I'll just put it another way. The chef has now been replaced by the image of the forager. The farmer has been replaced by the image of the fisherman. 
And what I mean by both of these things is instead of our attention being devoted to a farm like Michele's, our attention is devoted to a single human being somewhere out in the wilderness. And so what I'm emphasizing now is people in the first world pay a vast amount of money to be presented with these plates, which plates are supposed to call up not an image of the luxury of Louis XIV, but the asceticism of the monk, the solitary work of the fisherman. This is all very, very interesting to me. And it is essential, I think, to confront this in trying to understand what it means to understand my own work in the world of luxury products. And it is only a beginning that I'm proposing. I'm not proposing anything like an answer. In some sense, what I'm proposing is merely descriptive or phenomenological. But having been chastened by Professor Finnis, I feel like I must include some degree of criticism and not just what I might have just called an exegesis of the plate. And this is the criticism. And it's criticism I mean not as something that is normative, not saying really what should be the case or shouldn't be the case, though of course that's the next step for us. What I mean in my critical thoughts is this. The advent of this kind of luxury, and this is where I agree completely with Michele, the advent of this kind of luxury seems to me almost a final moment in the separation of human beings from nature, where they crave a reattachment to nature through the highly, highly artificial and very expensive construction of really interesting experiences, but which in themselves have nothing to do with you, the diner, plunging your hand into the earth. And so having pointed to this, what I think I would like to say is that the danger that I see not just in my own work, but in the consumption of the fruits of my labor, the danger is not the danger of inebriation, the danger of excess. The danger is the danger of separation. Separation from the earthly world, from the beating of hearts, from flesh. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. So I think now, let's, um, let's if, maybe you've been responding to Kelly pretty directly, but Jim, would you like to, to jump in to address anything that's been said by, by the panelists, and then we'll, then we'll move to questions. I think that, I guess for me, I'm, well, I'm still swallowing that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. Why? Why? I know. Oh, it's my um, name. <laughs> there was, I think that, I wrote some notes down, and I guess I'll, I'll kind of put, put them out there to you guys and also to the world. And I think with respect to what we're talking about, hunger seems to be a central issue. And, and, and when I say hunger, I don't, you know, that can relate to hunger just for food, for energy. But, it, but I think it also has to do with hunger and, and also appetite and what, how that relates to luxury or how that relates to um, social responsibility, you know, eating not necessarily, as you were saying, the sparseness of the place at Noma. One of the hallmarks I think of a great fine dining meal I've found is I've also had the luxury of going out, is after a long tasting menu, I don't leave so full that I can't sleep that night. I leave actually like perfectly safe. Um, so I think the notion that we're talking about with respect to luxury is how much food are we eating and what type of food it is. And I think with respect to Michaela's uh, his presentation, uh, something that really struck me there was how his wines tell a story. And I think whether we're talking about Kayla's wines or Abe's wines or my cocktails, I think the way in which we could call them luxury, but, but I don't know if that that's the best word, but the way in which a beautiful glass of wine or a perfectly balanced cocktail served by someone who's trying to make something special for you, it connects you to a time and a place and, and that connection to memory that, you know, the, the way in which food and our senses kind of connect to memory is very unique. And, and I think that for me centers, as Abe is saying, the, this talk from being apologetic to actually forcing people to actually look at, you know, maybe, maybe you think back to the last time someone offered you a glass of Dom Perignon. And I'm not saying that that winer is, is as good or should be talked about in the way that, that their wines are, but certain things that we eat and drink bring us back to very special memories that, that provide solace to a lot of people. 
and make them smile. And I think that speaks to the, to the sort of nourishment of the spirit and the feeling of, uh, that, that what, our, what we bring to the world can do. Can we start with some questions then? Thank you. Yeah, this, Carter? this is more of a reaction to an aid, what you were suggesting. And I was trying to imagine why is it people would spend all the money that they spend to go to NOMA or get on the waiting list or do whatever they have to do to, to go to NOMA and get the thing that you described, which is something that's foraged or something that's not, it's not a necessarily really expensive thing, go leave or whatever. Obviously, for some people, it's just the status of having gone to Noma because it's a, it's a, but that's a, that's not an interesting answer. The answer is why is that the status symbol? Um, it, it, and this I think connects to what you were saying about sort of the yearning for connection, and it's ironic because I think people go to places like that now with the proliferation of media with respect to food and wine. Like I'm going to go to a place where Rene Redzepi picked the thing with his hand and is putting on. So I'm somehow connected now to this person. Well, I don't know, but I've seen on TV, it's very it's an iconic sort of figure. So that it's, a, it's seeking a kind of intimate connection because it's small and maybe he's there and maybe he's the one that prepared the plate. That, that to me is, I, mean, I understand that because that's how I feel sometimes. I'm like, oh wow, I'm making more, you know. And, or if you have friends who are winemakers, when I drink your wine or McKelly's wine, I think about you all and, it, and I feel connected to you. I feel like that's more authentic and good. But if I go to, you know, La Bernadette and I spend a lot of money, I'm like, Maybe Eric Repair will be there and I can see him. And it's not just celebrity, but it's, it's a weird kind of yearning for a connection, an intimate connection. You know, Eric Repair is feeding me. And that's kind of, it's sad in a way that you're describing this sort of artifact. You're creating the artifice of the fake image of something that's real. Is that? I yeah, I agree, I agree completely. I think I said to a few of you that I rewrote my paper three or four times since I've been here. Every time I hear another talk, I rewrite the paper. And to some degree, what I said just now is deeply influenced by having listened to John Waters an hour ago. And so what you are talking about now, I feel like, is the negative image of what he had described, of some very personal relationship that involves somebody certainly not just giving you something, something wonderful about giving somebody a plate of food, one of the most wonderful things at all. But part of what I learned from listening to him is the culmination of that is when the person who gives you the food gazes in your eyes as they do it. And what you're describing now with Rene Rosepi and Eric Repair is the opposite of that. Paula. But um, how many times Christ speaks of either of wine or the image of the banquet as, um, as, as the heavenly life, or the image of you know, um, the spilling of perfume over Christ, and he's, he's him saying, the poor you will have um, with you always, this woman has done a good thing. Right? So this, these are all images of luxury and celebration which is something that shows an aspect of the spiritual life. And in that way, we can say, they're fine. They, we can reconcile them with uh, poverty. The poor will always be with us. That doesn't mean we can't celebrate. That doesn't mean we can't have fine things. Sometimes it's good to celebrate. Um, so that's the, the apologetic part. But then I keep thinking, what would Pope Francis say? Um, his whole thing of, you know, the carnival is over. The carnival in the church is over. Um, we need to cut back, right? And especially a call to, not to winemakers and to, to um, uh, celebrity chefs, but to the clergy, um, to the hierarchy of the church to stop driving. You know, don't get the, the, the best watch, don't get the best car, don't get, this doesn't mean living at austere poverty, but it means your calling is, is one of service. So it is fundamentally immoral for you to have these luxury goods, even though you can afford them. So, uh. so I think what's what's interesting about the way our panelists have talked about the wine that they make and the, and the spirits that they are, are connected to and serve is that. They all seem to be pushing toward away from the idea of luxury and more towards the idea of richness. 
Um, and it seems to me that even a Franciscan church can celebrate richness of the kind that they're describing. There, there's connectivity among, and Michele talked about the, the community, 1974 maybe, but the, the whole of the community, the beauty of the products that they create and celebrate together. Uh, Jim has been talking about the, um, the service, the, the, the kindness, the bar, I mean, the, the cliche image of the bartender is the listener, right? You can tell the bartender all of your stories. Uh, and Abe is, is pointing to something that is really um, intriguing to me. I don't know if you've all seen the film Melancholia by Lars von Trier. At the end, it's, about the, it's a movie about the end of the world. And the, and the last image, I'm not going to give away the film, the last image just before the, the world ends is of a person making shelter in something incredibly um, temporary and fragile. Um, frugal, uh, spare, sparse, right? And that the, and then it's over and the, the film leaves you without any sort of catharsis. And I'm wondering whether the super rich go to Rene Rizepi encounter not something that's monastic or rich in the way that our parents have been describing, but encounter something that enables them to um, dispel some, I don't know if it's guilt or dispel. There's some sort of cathartic effect. How do we articulate that cathartic effect? I mean, I think for me as I, as we, as we look at society today, and look at role models in society, uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of, you know, those of us in schools like this, who went to schools like this, idolize athletes, and we have all sorts of stories coming out about the athletes that we idolize. We may idolize, you know, certain politicians, or there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, disappointing information coming out in the world right now about people that we, Idolize and kind of put up there as heroes, and, and I think one of the one of the characteristics of chefs that is something that I've considered a lot. For, you know, for what I do for a living, I make cocktails. And if you guys have, you know, if, if for as far as the reach of the platform that I have, if you don't have a great Negroni tomorrow, you'll be okay. Like you might actually be better. Whereas um, all of us need to eat. You know, if we don't eat, we're going to die. So in that sense, I feel like chefs um, can connect to people in a way that, that not everyone can. And I think this sort of idol, you know, idolizing chefs is something that's kind of new, and I guess it has a lot to do maybe with television, but I think it's an, they're an interesting model for, for heroism. And, and I think while not all of them, like while Renee and Eric and these kind of very famous chefs can't serve everyone, like Michaela was talking about, their restaurants function as uh, these these little families where the the values of the chef uh, or the, the the people who own the restaurant can kind of play out, and I think as as you were saying, as wine and spirits and cars and everything is industrialized, these little restaurants have these little family-like structures, which I think that people are starting to connect with in a way that they weren't before. I I hate to to um, be a voice of doom and something negative in the midst of your ability and Kelly's ability to celebrate the goodness of these things. But Carter mentioned Le Bernadette. Everybody in this room might have to pool their money for two of us to dine there. So it's very important to talk about some other kind of restaurant. And Kelly mentioned at the very beginning of his talk that in explaining, I'm going to paraphrase you and I hope I get it right, in explaining what was important about quality wine, you were talking from the beginning about wines, I think you said that might cost 10 or 100 times the cost of a normal bottle. And then you closed your talk by drawing a distinction between the work that you do and the work that faceless corporations do. Faceless corporations produce bottles of wine that everybody here can afford. So that's, I don't know how to phrase this as a question, but. I feel like we have to be careful about pointing to a certain kind of goodness without conceding the financial cost and the inaccessibility of these goods. 
One thing that comes to mind that I've thought a lot about is the, the distinction between what is fine and what is rare. And those are also words that come out of luxury spirits and luxury wine. But it's an important distinction to me because as you, you know, going back to the Pappy Van Winkle, Pappy Van Winkle is not a better bourbon than many of the other whiskeys that come from the same distillery, but it's the one that everyone wants and there's only a limited amount. And I think that what you're pointing to absolutely correctly, and I totally agree with, is that you know there are one of the reasons why the cost of the seats at La Bernadette or Noma or a lot of these great restaurants is so high is because the demand is high. If they couldn't fill their dining rooms, it'd be a lot easier to get a, a, a reservation in those places. So for me, I think our focus or our job, as you said at the end of your speech, is to dedicate ourselves not to putting things on higher pinnacles and on higher plateaus and sort of becoming more attainable and only celebrating the attainable, but it's trying to figure out how we can feed more people and how we can feed them better food or in the case of, you know, you know, wine or, or cocktails. I think that a great glass of wine or cocktail or something to eat should not be something that, that is either unaffordable or unattainable. And I think there is where we center our focus on not what is rare, because we can cast that aside, but what is fine. Do we have a question here? And then, uh, well, what this uh, project grows as the University of Eichstätt in Germany. What this resonates in me is the experience of eating in a monastery near Eichstätt, where I come from, where they produce biologic food and stuff. So what you said about Oma, I it, it reminded me of this. But uh, then on, as a medical doctor, and thinking about hospitals, this may seem out of place now, but I, I explain. Thinking about hospitals, hospitals produce at an enormous cost something that is extremely rare and even at enormous cost not available. And that is real care. And uh, that was there when the monasteries had the hospitals. And and it, it didn't cost very much. Uh, now, this is gone, and we try to reproduce that at enormous cost, and we don't manage to reproduce it. it sounds like no one. And um, at the same time, when, when the monasteries produced gratuitously this food, and such as, I mean, this food is enormously cheap in this monastery where I go to eat. And it's so delicious that I think it might probably not be the problem, but it's, and, and so there is a gratuity in the activity of these monks uh, that when you try to reproduce it in a, I would say, alienated system, then the cost of this goes up like hell. So uh, that, that is what resonates in me, that we try to find a surrogate for something that reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home, but home is gone, and now we try surrogate home. broad agreement with that on. <laughs> I think that's true. I mean, that's the central irony is that the, the, the very things that we are celebrating here are, are um, become expensive in this context, in this kind of industrial yeah. Right. Right. So they're trying to run a, in circles. Around. They're coming back to what they already, we had changed. Now we have to so there's a structure of mourning to this or something. There's something. Well put, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean at the same time I want to celebrate for sure. I feel like one in full conscience one has to be mourning something too. We make amazing wines. I mean you, you some of you who have tasted them, I'm immensely proud of them. But there's something else too. I'm sorry, we didn't mean to neglect your question. Fine. Um something you could Certainly, it seems that you know, we, we do actually need you know, uh, these larger, more personal uh, appropriations of firms to produce things in large quantities cheaply so that people can have them. How could we go about incorporating some of the, the personal, uh, personalism and the, uh, uh, the aesthetic value in uh, these luxury goods into you know, the, this, this sort of general medium? Mass uh, commerce that most of us actually can interact with more on a day to day basis. Could I direct that a little bit towards Jim first? Jim, can you come back? With, it sounds like the, he's asking maybe the craft beer is that a potential model? I think, I mean, one of the 
thing that I, I was thinking about earlier and what you're saying sort of makes me think about is that I think that in some ways the, uh, like, let, let's just say that, that I had a glass of one of their wines and, and a steak and, you know, some monastery greens and some, like, my favorite mineral water. And, I, like, I was just, someone just handed to me right here, perfectly cooked by Rene Rizzetti. And all of you are out there, no food. I wouldn't enjoy that food the way that I would if all of us were eating together. And I wouldn't enjoy it either if you guys all had, like, a twig, you know, and I was eating that. So in some ways, I think the, I don't think that the mass-produced food out there should, I, I, I think it's, like, I think it's a big problem. <laughs> so I don't think that there's any reconciliation that I'm looking for for that, personally. I think I'm looking to sort of figure out a way in which to show people sort of maybe how you were suggesting how we can't all eat the same because of the land that we live around all produces different things, but I think we have to look at how we feed people globally and try and make some big changes and, and localize and regionalize them and also, you know, make it harder for people to eat better than everyone else to do it secretly or, no, or to do it away from that public. Can I just say something about arugula really briefly? Sure. Not long ago, you couldn't buy it at any price. And then it was really expensive. It was 5 or $10 a pound if you were the kind of person who wanted to eat arugula. And very soon, arugula will be uh, available in supermarkets. And I don't understand the economics of the very last thing I'm going to say. But supermarkets that will exist in disadvantaged areas in the United States that previously didn't have supermarkets. So all is not lost. And there is the possibility for everybody to eat something good. It look, I mean, that's for me just a sign that there are good things happening at the same time. That there are <coughs> massive faceless farming companies that are making arugula, surely not as good as arugula of the moss, but arugula nonetheless that a whole population can eat. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they're still promoting the foods that obviously not everyone can afford a luxury food, but a personal connection with the people with the food that and uh, goods that they're consuming. I saw two presentations this year. One was a TED talk. The other was at the the uh, presentation in Copenhagen that Renee was up to put on. And they both were about how in our in our in the modern world and probably internationally, when a when fruit or vegetables or food is is what's called ugly or blemished in some way, when when it comes to the supermarket with with some sort of physical defect, it's kind of quietly and carefully thrown in the garbage. And, and the amount of food that gets, edible, tasty food, that gets thrown in the garbage all over the world because it's not beautiful, because it's not gonna look nice in the supermarket is it's unbelievable. And a couple of these different people who spoke were talking about their mission to get this ugly fruit from these supermarkets or from even the farmers who would let it rot in the field and, and how they're feeding people this, uh, this ugly fruit using uh, different methods. So I think that in order to answer that question, and in order for you to feel probably good about what you're doing, you know, I think the fact that you're questioning it's what's going to happen with your work is important. But I think the answer to your question is, is I don't think you're the final. We have a lot of problems we have to deal with in our food distribution system, in my opinion, before we worry about some of those things. I just heard Mark Bidman also speak last week about food and what's going on. He was saying that, you know, in the sense, like genetically modified crops, he, he was saying that or to evaluate what's going on with food, that the treatment, the cruelty to animals, to, you know, to, to chickens or to cows or to, you know, livestock is a much greater concern that we should be addressing besides genetically modified crops, which sort of don't necessarily play such a huge role in what problems we're having right now. So I think that, you know, it's great that you're considering it already and just that, I think we got, we got bigger problems. Yeah, I agree strongly with what Jim said. And I think that I support the thoughtful incorporation of chemical engineering and food production at every level. And that what I was pointing to was not something like mere wistfulness, hoping that we would return to an era in which every person who ate was fed by an individual farmer. That's long past. So maybe what all I was pointing was that there's something healthy about regret and not papering it over, and then absolutely full speed ahead with chemical engineering. Thoughtful, careful, but don't by any means think, I mean, I'll put it another way. I sat next to a grape breeder the other night at dinner, and he poo-pooed the fetishism um, of heirloom tomatoes, and I thought, he's absolutely right. Like, that's a form of nostalgia, not a form of positive thinking to focus all of our interest on heirloom tomatoes and not to pay attention to the benefits brought to us by breeding. After all, as he pointed out, heirloom tomatoes were simply the results of breeding 100 years ago rather than last year. Okay, so I'm not sure if there's a really good answer to this, so I'm going to be surprised if you can't get the right one. But um, there's obviously two extremes, you know, we've got Either we can not enjoy any of these luxury goods and try to make sure that there's no people in the world who are hungry, which is you know, probably impossible. But. Or we can have this huge disparity between lots of people starving in India and other people buying you know, $7,000 cakes and stuff. Right? So I guess I'm wondering, where, where do you think, how do we draw that line? How do, how do we start deciding um, what luxuries are, are okay with goods, with goods we can justify spending money on enjoying because there's a limited number of these goods, right? Not everyone can have them. Um, you know, how do we how do we make those decisions? I'm happy to say that John Waters struggled with the same question again only an hour ago right here. It's so difficult. The, the, that there is an answer. I have a comment on that. It grows out of what you, you all have said, and, and we heard Jim speak, as I have heard him speak before, about his mentors, right? And you're one of part of them. One, one thing that's happening with these movements of craft products and farm to table and celebrity chefs is people are, many people, more ambitious home chefs like Carter, who's not the wealthiest person on earth, but 
serves food that would happily be served at New York's restaurants that are quite expensive. There's mentoring and learning and growing for people so that things that are fine don't have to be as rare. Right? And so yeah. you're sending, there's no reason, and this is no insult to you, Jim, there's no reason that the bartenders at TGI Fridays couldn't do what some of your bartenders do. It's just that they haven't learned to treat people as well as you've taught, been taught to treat people and have taught your folks in turn. So some of it is you're building a movement of fine things to make them less rare. And you do a lot of education and a lot of charity events that put that out there. I think the answer to the question is with great power comes great responsibility. And the people who are the most powerful and wealthy in the world have to take, have to make this part of their job, you know, to justify that power and that wealth. And I think that we all, with that being said, we all have to do it, but we all have to do it within our own means. I mean, one of the things that we learn working in the restaurant business is you can't help others before you've helped yourself. So you might be working in your restaurant station and someone else needs help carrying plates and someone else needs you know, clearing table, whatever it is, and then suddenly your, your section's on fire. So I think that you've got to, as soon as you've got your life in control and you've got things under order, you can start worrying about other people. But until you've got yourself in order, you can't help someone else. I'm sensing some guilt from you guys. And let me oh, attempt to, uh, to help you feel better. I'm just Irish and Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> is, isn't maybe the solution here, what do you do when you take all this money from the rich? If you do good things with it, you've relieved me of $7,000 for one bottle of wine. I, I didn't need the 7000 Now, if you do something positive with that, if all luxury goods wine, food, goods, cars, etc. If they can find it upon themselves to realize they're the beneficiary of a lot of wealth, this is a wealth, this is a redistribution strategy. If luxury goods world can do good things with, with those funds, then I don't think it's just a lose lose. I think it can be a, a, a lose point. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to help you out. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, I meant to be expressing seriousness and concern, which is not the same thing as guilt. And one of the reasons why I think I was not feeling guilty in the way that, that you had thought is because the man who taught me how to make wine is a great moral instructor in many ways. And one of the first lessons that he taught me was the one that you just enunciated. He's an extremely successful winemaker in Napa who makes wine much more expensive than mine. And he even used the phrase that you used, also a phrase that's been used on other occasions in this conference. He said that his winemaking operation was a system for the redistribution of wealth. In particular, the transfer of money from orthodontists in Houston to chamber <laughs> music players in Boston. So he, ha he had that thought and passed that on to me. My business is not mature enough yet to be transferring any wealth outside of it. But, but that, is, that is something that I have agreed with from the beginning. So I haven't felt guilty about that. But what I have been concerned about was what I was pointing to more deeply, and that is the possibility that the consumption of the goods that I produce, instead of bringing other human beings closer to nature, could do the opposite. I know there's a sense in which when you consume wine, especially wine made as carefully as ours, that it has to bring you closer to nature in just the way that B. Kelly set out. But I think also in the way that I set out, it can create distance. That's more my concern. Could we, we have a, we started five minutes late, so we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, and then if there are any completing remarks that you'd like to make, we'll be done with that, so please. Um, mine's kind of a reflection that ends in a question. I, as you've been speaking, I've been trying to figure out in my mind this question of luxury. I think in all human hearts, there's, a, there's a, an unholy temptation to want things that no one else can have. And we pursue certain things because they separate us and make us feel superior and in some way we have something and we'd like it better because no one can have it. But, and Jim was saying before that he wouldn't want to be doing that if nobody else in the room had it. And I, and I was thinking of the whole theme of solidarity with the poor. I think, I think beauty unites people. And I think if, if the pursuit is a pursuit of beauty, and beauty can be a taste as well. And there's a lot, so I mentioned the Bible, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. There's, these, there's metaphors used even for the spiritual life about relishing and tasting. That, in a way, the, the cost of that, the price on that, 
is not the, the number one concern. It's, it's the pursuit of something which is beautiful and good, and you'd like everyone to have it. It's not like you're trying to make something that you intentionally don't want people to be able to afford except a very few. You wish everyone could have it. Some will, maybe in the future more will be able to. There's a lot more good wine produced in California now than there was 15 years ago, much more. And some of it, the prices are, are they're all over the map. But I, th I think that is a good, and the fact that not everyone can have it at this moment doesn't mean that you're not benefiting humanity and that you're not in solidarity with the poor in creating beauty. And beauty by its nature is meant to be shared and becomes more beautiful when it's, when it's communal. But I think that the downside is that, that danger of wanting exclusivity for its own sake. I'd love to respond to that. I, I agree with everything you said. I, what I'd like to add um, to, I'd like to add one thing that completely supports what you said, and then something that I think causes us at least to look in a somewhat other direction. What supports it, and what I, I feel like is a sign that wine is by nature a good thing, and good in just the way you describe, is wine is almost never produced in personal size volume. It is always, always, whether it's in a, a, a cask, a barrel, a keg, or even a 750 milliliter bottle, it's always put out into the world as something to share. So that, that's something I think that is important, even if it was never intentional, it supports what you said. <laughs> now what I'd, what I'd like to say that goes in a somewhat other direction, Professor Sneed and I are both alumni of the same college, St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. And the first time in which I stepped away from being a winemaker and engaged in any of these reflections was at St. John's College in Santa Fe at the instigation of another friend of ours, the Dean Walter Sterling. And in the question period after my talk, one of my colleagues there brought up the following point in relation to, a, I hope I'm gonna get the word right, <coughs> the savor that God smelled after Noah's sacrifice. And what my colleague pointed out is that a uh, savor was something that, unlike wine, could be shared among an infinite number of human beings because one didn't have to divide up something that was finite and couldn't be extended forever. So that, for me, has always been a really interesting model of something that is similar to what you said about wine, but very different. <coughs> Thank you so much.